Chapter 6. Just before dawn she awoke. But not completely. The drug was still with her. Dreams still with her. Strange violent dreams, erotic and crushing and wonderful and hurting and sensuous and awful and never before experienced or so intense. Through the half-open shutters she saw the eastern horizon blood red, weird suggestive cloud formations there that seemed to match etchings in her mind. As she moved to see them better there was a slight ache in her loins, but she paid it no attention, instead letting her eyes dwell on the pictures in the sky and allowing her mind to drift back into the dreams that beckoned irresistibly. On the threshold of sleep she became aware she was naked. Languidly she pulled her nightdress around her and the sheet over her. And slept. Ori was standing beside the bed. He had just moved out of the warmth. His ninja clothes were on the floor. And his loincloth. For a moment he looked down at her lying there, considering her a final time. So sad, he thought, last times are so sad. Then he picked up the short knife sword and unsheathed it. In the room downstairs Philip Tyra opened his eyes. His surroundings were unfamiliar, then he realized that he was still in the temple at Kanagawa, that yesterday had been terrible, the operation awful, his part despicable. Babcock said I was in shock, he muttered, his mouth parched and bad tasting. Christ, does that excuse me? His shutters were ajar, a wind creaking them. He could see the dawn. Red sky in the morning, shepherd's warning. Will there be a storm? He wondered then sat up in the camp bed and checked the bandage on his arm. It was clean, without fresh blood stains, and he was greatly relieved. Apart from the throb in his head and some soreness he felt whole again. Oh, God, I wish I'd acted better. He made an effort to remember the aftermath of the operation but it was harsed. I know I cried. It didn't feel like crying, the tears flooded. With an effort he pushed the gloomy thoughts away. He got out of bed and shoved the shutters open, strong now on his legs and hungry. Nearby there was water in a jug and he splashed some on his face and rinsed out his mouth and spat the water into the garden foliage. After he had a little water, he felt better. The garden was empty, the air smelling of rotting vegetation and low tide. From where he was he could see a section of the temple walls and the garden but little else. Through a gap in the trees he caught a glimpse of the guardhouse and two soldiers there. Now he noticed that he had been put to bed in his shirt and long woolen underpants. His torn, blood-stained coat was over a chair, his trousers and riding boots, filthy from the paddy, beside it. Never mind, I'm lucky to be alive. He began to dress. What about Struan, and Babcott, soon I'll have to face him. There was no razor so he could not shave. Nor was there a comb. Again never mind. He pulled on his boots. From the garden he could hear the sound of birds and movement, a few distant shouts in Japanese, and dogs barking. But no sounds as in a normal town, an English town, no morning cries of, hot cross buns oh, or, fresh water oh, or, Colchester oysters, morning fresh, for sale, for sale oh, or, direct from the press, the latest chapter by Mr. Dickens, Only a Penny, Only a Penny, or, The Times, The Times, read all about Mr. Disraeli's great scandal, read all about it. Will I be dismissed? He asked himself, his stomach surging at the thought of returning home in ignominy, a disaster, a failure, no longer a member of Her Illustrious Majesty's Foreign Office, representative of the greatest empire the world has ever known. What will Sir William think of me? And what about her? Angelique. Thank God she escaped to Yokohama. Will she ever talk to me again when she hears? Oh, God, what am I going to do? Malcolm Struan was also awake. A few moments before, some sixth sense of danger, a noise from outside, had wakened him. Though lying here it felt as though he had been awake for hours. He lay on the camp bed, aware of the day and the operation and that he had been severely wounded and that the chances were that he would die. Every breath caused a sharp, tearing pain. Even the slightest movement. But I'm not going to think about pain, only about Angelique and that she loves me and... But what about the bad dreams? Dreams of her hating me and running away. 
I hate dreams and being out of control, hate lying here, loathe being weak when I've always been strong, always brought up in the shadow of my hero, the great Dirk Struan, green-eyed devil. Oh, how I wish I had green eyes and could be so strong. He's my lodestone and I will be as good as him, I will. As always, the enemy Tyler Brock is stalking us. Father and mother try to keep most of the facts from me, but of course I've heard the rumors and know more than they think. Old R. Tok, more mother to me than mother, didn't she carry me until I was two and teach me Cantonese and about life and find me my first girl? She whispers the rumors to me, so does Uncle Gordon Chen, who tells me facts. The noble house is teetering. Never mind, we'll deal with them. I will. That's what I'm trained for and have worked for all my life. He moved the blanket aside and lifted his legs to stand, but pain stopped him. Again he tried and again failed. Never mind, he told himself weakly. Nothing to worry about, I'll do it later. More eggs, Cetri, Marlow said, as tall as the dragoon officer but not as broad in the shoulders. Both were patrician, sons of serving senior officers, well formed in the face, weathered, Marlow more so. No. Thanks, Cetri Paladar said. Two's my limit. Must confess that I think the cooking here is vile. I told the servants I like my eggs well done, not ph leg me, but they've sand for brains. Actually, damned if I can eat eggs unless they're on toast, on good English bread. They just don't taste the same. What do you think's going to happen, about Canterbury? Marlowe hesitated. They were in the legation dining room at the vast oak table that could seat twenty, brought from England for just this purpose. The corner room was spacious and pleasing, windows open to the garden and the dawn. Three liveried Chinese servants served the two of them, places laid for half a dozen. Fried eggs and bacon in silver salvers warmed by candles, roast chicken, cold salt ham and mushroom pie, a side of almost rancid beef, hardtack biscuits, a dried apple pie. Beer, porter and tea. The minister should ask for immediate reparations and the murderers to be handed over at once, and when there's the inevitable delay, he should order the fleet against Yedo. Better that we land in force, we've troops enough, and occupy the capital, remove their king, what's he called? Ah yes, shogun, and appoint our own native ruler and make Japan a protectorate. Even better, for them, make it part of the empire. Paladar was very tired and had been awake most of the night. His uniform was unbuttoned but he was groomed and had shaved. He motioned to one of the servants. Tea, please. The neatly dressed young Chinese understood perfectly but he gaped at him, deliberately, for the amusement of the other servants. Heya, Masser, T.R., what for T.R. you say, eh? Wancha Cha, Heya, oh. Never mind, for Christ's sake. Wearily Paladar got up and went to the sideboard with his cup and poured his own tea, while all the servants guffaw hugely but silently at the insolent foreign devil's loss of face, and then continued listening attentively to what they were saying. It's a matter of military might, old boy. And I'll tell you frankly, the general will be bloody upset about losing a grenadier to a poxy assassin dressed like Ali Baba. He'll want and we'll all want, revenge, by God. I don't know about a landing, the navy can certainly blast a path for you but we've no idea how many samurai there are, nor anything about their strength. For God's sake, whatever they are, or it is, we can deal with them, they're only a bunch of backward natives. Of course we can deal with them. Just like in China. Can't understand why we don't annex China and have done with it. All the servants heard this and understood this and all swore that when the heavenly kingdom possessed the guns and the ships to equal the barbarian guns and ships, they would help shove barbarian noses in their own dung and teach them a lesson to last a thousand generations. All of them were handpicked by illustrious Chen, Gordon Chen, the noble house comprador. You want a one PC plenty good, GGS, Masser, the most courageous one said, and being toothily, holding more of the deliberately ph leg me eggs under Paladar's nose. Very good. Paladar shoved the salver away in disgust. No. Thanks. Listen, 
Marlow, I think. He stopped as the door opened and Tyra came in. Oh, hello. You must be Philip Tyra from the legation. He introduced himself, then Marlow, and went on breezily, very sorry about your bad luck yesterday but I'm proud to shake your hand. Both Mr. Struan and Miss Richo told Babcott if it wasn't for you they'd both be dead. They did. Oh, Tyra could hardly believe his ears. It, it all happened so fast. One moment everything was normal, the next we were running for our lives. I was frightened to death. Now that he had said it aloud he felt better, and even better when they brushed it aside as modesty, held out a chair for him and ordered the servants to bring him food. Marlow said, when I checked you in the night you were dead to the world, we knew Babcott had sedated you, so I expect you haven't yet heard about our assassin. Tyra's stomach reeled. Assassin, they told him, and about Angelique. She's here, yes, and what a brave lady she is. For a moment Marlow was filled with the thought of her. He had no favored girl at home or anywhere, just a few eligible cousins but no special lady, and for the first time he was happy about it. Perhaps Angelique will stay and then, and then we'll see. His excitement picked up. Just before steaming out of his home port of Plymouth a year ago, his father, Captain Richard Marlow R.N., had said, You're 27, lad, you've your own ship now. Albeit a stinkpot, you're the eldest and it's time you were married. When you get back from this far east cruise you'll be over 30. With any luck by then I'll be a vice admiral and I'll, well, I can allow you a few extra guineas, but for God's sake, don't tell your mother, or your brothers and sisters. It's time you made up your mind. What about your cousin Delphi? Her father's service, though only Indian Army. He had promised that on his return he would choose. Now perhaps he would not have to settle for second or third or fourth best. Miss Angelique raised the alarm in the settlement then insisted on coming here last night. Mr. Struan had asked her to see him urgently. Seems he's not too good, pretty bad wound in fact, so I brought her. She's quite a lady. Yes. A curious silence took them, each knowing the other's thoughts. Philip Tyra broke it. Why should an assassin come here? The other two heard the nervousness. More devilment, I suppose, Paladar said. Nothing to worry about, we caught the bugger. Have you seen Mr. Struan this morning? I peeked in but he was asleep, hope he's going to be all right. The op was not so good and Tyra stopped, hearing an altercation outside. Paladar went to the window followed by the others. Sergeant Towery was shouting at a half-naked Japanese from the far side of the garden, beckoning him. Hey, you, come, eh. The man, apparently a gardener, was well built and young and twenty yards away. He wore only a loincloth and was carrying a bundle of sticks and branches over one shoulder, some half wrapped in a dirty black cloth, while he awkwardly scavenged for others. For a moment he stood erect, then began bobbing up and down, bowing abjectly towards the sergeant. My God, these buggers have no sense of shame, Paladar said distastefully. Even the Chinese don't dress like that, nor Indians. You can see his privates. I'm told they dress like that even in winter, some of them, Marlow said. They don't seem to feel the cold. Again Towery shouted and beckoned. The man kept on bowing, nodding vigorously, but instead of going towards him, seemingly he misinterpreted him and obediently turned away, still half bowing, and scuttled away, heading for the corner of the building. As he passed their window he gazed at them for an instant, then once more bent double in a groveling obeisance and hurried towards the servants' quarters, almost hidden by foliage, and was gone. Curious, Marlow said. What? Oh, just that all that bowing and scraping seemed put on. Marlow turned and saw Tyra's chalky face. Christ Almighty, what's up? I, I, that man, I think he, I'm not sure but I think he was one of them, one of the murderers of the Takedo, the one Struin shot. Did you see his shoulder, wasn't it bandaged? Paladar was the first to react. He jumped out of the window, closely followed by Marlow who had grabbed his sword. Together they hurtled for the trees. But they did not find him though they searched everywhere. Now it was high noon. Again the soft knock on her bedroom door, 
Again, Mademoiselle. Mademoiselle. Babcock called out from the corridor, his voice soft, not wanting to awaken her unnecessarily, but she did not reply. She remained standing rock still in the center of the room and stared at the bolted door, hardly breathing, her robe tight around her, her face stark. The trembling began again. Mademoiselle. She waited. After a moment his footsteps died away and she exhaled, desperately trying to stop shaking, then resumed pacing to the shuttered windows and back to the bed and back to the windows once more, pacing as she had been pacing for hours. I've got to decide, she thought in misery. When she awoke a second time, not remembering the first awakening, her mind was clear and she lay in the crumpled bed linen without moving, glad to be awake, rested, hungry, and thirsty for the first, glorious cup of coffee of the day served with some crusty fresh French bread that her legation chef made in Yokohama. But I'm not in Yokohama, I'm in Kanagawa, and today it will be just a cup of revolting English tea with milk. Malcolm, poor Malcolm, I do so hope he's better. We'll return to Yokohama today, I'll board the next steamer for Hong Kong, thence to Paris, but oh, what dreams I had, what dreams. The fantasies of the night were still vivid and mixed up with other pictures of the Tokaido and Canterbury's mutilation and Malcolm acting so strangely presuming that they would marry. The imagined smell of the surgery rose in her nostrils but she fought it away, yawned, and reached for her little timepiece which she had left on the bedside table. With the slight movement came a small pain in her loins. For a moment she wondered if it presaged an early period, for she was not completely regular, but dismissed the thought as impossible. The timepiece read 10 to 20. It was inset with lapis lazuli and had been her father's gift on her 18th birthday, July 8, a little over two months ago in Hong Kong. So much has happened since then, she thought. I'll be so happy to be back in Paris, in civilization, never to return, never never nev. Abruptly she realized that she was almost naked under the sheet. To her astonishment she found that her nightdress only clung to her arms and shoulders and was totally split down the front and scrambled up behind her. She lifted the two sides in disbelief. Wanting to see better, she slid out of bed to go to the window but again felt the slight soreness. Now in the day's light she noticed the telltale smear of blood on the sheet and found a trace between her legs. How can my period? She began counting days and recounting them but the addition made no sense. Her last period had stopped two weeks ago. Then she noticed that she was slightly moist and could not understand why, then her heart twisted and she almost fainted as her brain shouted that the dreams had not been dreams but real and that she had been violated while asleep. That's not possible. You must be mad. That's not possible. She had gasped, fighting for air, fighting for space. Oh, God, let this be a dream, part of those dreams. She groped for the bed, heart pounding. You're awake, this isn't a dream, you're awake. She examined herself again, frantically, and then again but this time with more care. She had enough knowledge to know that there was no mistake about the moisture, or that her hymen was split. It was true, she had been raped. The room began to spin. Oh, God, I'm ruined. Life ruined, future ruined for no decent man, eligible man will marry me now that I'm soiled, marriage a girl's only way to better herself, have a happy future, any future, no other way. When her senses settled and she could see and think, she found herself lying across the bed. Shakily she tried to reconstruct the night. I remember bolting the door. She peered at it. The bar was still in place. I remember Malcolm and the foulness of his room and running away from him, Philip Tyra sleeping peacefully, Dr. Babcott giving me the drink and going upstairs. The drink, oh, God, I was drugged. If Babcock can operate with these drugs, of course it could happen, of course I would be helpless, but that doesn't help me now. It happened. Say I get a child. Again panic overwhelmed her. Tears gushed down her cheeks and she almost cried out. Stop it. She muttered, making a supreme effort for control. Stop it. Don't make a sound, don't. You're alone, no one else can help, just you, you've got to think. What are you going to do? Think. 
She took deep breaths, her heart hurting, and tried to slam her jumbled mind into order. Who was the man? The bar's still in place so no one could have come through the door. Wait a minute, I remember vaguely, or was it part of the dream before the... I seem to remember opening the door to, to Babcott and, and the naval officer Marlowe, then barring it again. Yes, that's right, at least, I think that's right. Didn't he speak French? Yes, he did, but badly, then they went away and I barred the door, I'm sure I did. But why did they knock on the door in the night? She searched and researched her mind but could not find an answer, not truly sure this had happened, the night pictures slipping away. Some of them, concentrate. If not through the door he came through the window. She squirmed around and saw that the shutter bar was on the floor, below the window, not in its slots. So whoever it was got in through the window. Who, Marlowe, that paladar or even the good doctor, I know they all want me. Who knew I was drugged? Babcott. He could have told the others but surely none of them would dare to be so evil, would dare risk the consequences of climbing up from the garden for of course I would shout from the rooftops. Her whole being screamed a warning. Be careful. Your future depends on being careful and wise. Be careful. Are you sure that this really happened in the night? What about the dreams? Perhaps. I won't think about them now but only a doctor would know for certain and that would have to be Babcott. Wait, you could, you could have ruptured that tiny piece of skin in your sleep, twisting in the nightmare, it was a nightmare, wasn't it? That has happened to some girls. Yes, but they'd still be virgin and that doesn't explain the moisture. Remember Jeanette in the convent, poor silly Jeanette who fell in love with one of the tradesmen, and allowed him, and excitedly told us all about it later, all the details. She didn't become pregnant but she was found out and the next day she was gone forever, and later we learned she'd been married off to a village butcher, the only man who would take her. I didn't allow anything but that won't help me, a doctor would know for certain but that won't help me, and the idea of Babcott or any doctor being so intimate fills me with horror and then Babcott would share the secret. How could I trust him with such a secret? If it became known, I have to keep it secret. But how? How can you, and what then? I'll answer that later. First, decide who the devil was. No, first clean yourself of this evil and then you will think better. You've got to think clearly. With distaste she shook off the nightdress and threw it aside, then washed carefully and deeply, trying to remember all the contraceptive knowledge she possessed, what Jeanette had done successfully. Then she put on her robe and combed her hair. Using tooth powder, she cleaned her teeth. Only then did she look in her mirror. Very carefully she examined her face. It was without blemish. She loosened her robe. So were her limbs and breasts, nipples a little red. Again she looked deep into her mirror. No change, nothing, and everything. Then she noticed that the little gold cross she had worn forever, sleeping and waking, was gone. She searched the bed carefully, then underneath and all around. It was not buried in the bedclothes or under the pillows or caught in the curtains. Last chance, hiding in the lace of the coverlet. She picked it off the floor and went through it. Nothing. Then she saw the three Japanese characters, crudely drawn on its whiteness, in blood. Sunlight sparked off the gold cross. Ori was holding it in his fist by the thin chain, mesmerized. Why did you take it? Haraga asked. I don't know. Not killing the woman was a mistake. Shoran was right. It was a mistake. Karma. They were safe in the Inn of the Midnight Blossoms and Ori had bathed and shaved and he looked back at Haraga with level eyes and thought, You're not my master. I will tell you only what pleases me, nothing more. He had told him about Shoran's death and climbing into the room, that she had slept soundly and had not awakened, but no more, only that he had hidden there safely, then had taken off his ninja clothes knowing he would be intercepted and had camouflaged his swords with them, shinned down into the garden with just enough time to gather some fallen branches, to pretend to be a gardener before he was spotted and, even after recognizing the man from the road, had managed to escape. But nothing more about her. How can I express in mortal words and tell anyone that because of her I became one with the gods, 
that when I had spread her wide and saw her I was drunk with craving, that when I entered her, I entered her as a lover and not a rapist. I don't know why but I did, slowly, carefully, and her arms went around me and she shuddered and held on though she never truly awoke and she was so tight and I held back and back and then poured forth in a way inconceivable. I never believed it could be so marvelous, so sensual, so satisfying, so final. The others were nothing compared to her. She made me reach the stars, but that is not why I left her alive. I thought about killing her very much. Then myself, there in the room. But that would have been only selfish, to die at the crest of happiness, so content. Oh, how I wish to die. But my death belongs to Sono Joy. Only that. Not to me. Not killing her was a mistake, Haraga said again, interrupting Ori's thought pattern. Shoran was right. Killing her would have achieved our plan, better than anything. Yes. Then why? I left her alive for the gods. If there are gods, he could have said but did not. They possessed me and made me do what I did and I thank them. Now I am complete. I know life. All that remains to know is death. I was her first and she will remember me forever even though she slept. When she wakes and sees my writing in my own blood, not hers, she will know. I want her to live forever. I will die soon. Karma. Ori put the cross into a secret sleeve pocket of his kimono and drank more of the refreshing green tea, feeling utterly fulfilled and so alive. You said you had a raid? Yes. We are going to burn the British legation in Yedo. Good. Let it be soon. It is. Sono joy. At Yokohama, Sir William said angrily, tell them again, for the last time, by God. Her Majesty's government demands immediate reparations of £100,000 sterling in gold for allowing this unprovoked attack and murder of an Englishman. Killing Englishmen is Kinjiru, by God. And also we demand possession of the Satsuma murderers within three days or we will take definitive action. He was across the bay in the small, stuffy audience room of the British legation in Yokohama, flanked by the Prussian, French and Russian ministers, both admirals, British and French, the general, all of them equally exasperated. In line opposite, seated ceremoniously on chairs, were two local representatives of the Bakufu, the chief samurai of the settlement guard, and the governor of Kanagawa in whose jurisdiction Yokohama lay. They wore wide pantaloons and kimonos, and over them the broad-shouldered, wing-like mantle that was belted, and two swords. Clearly all were uncomfortable and inwardly furious. At dawn, armed soldiers had hammered on the door of the customs houses, in both Yokohama and Kanagawa, with rifle butts and unprecedented anger, summoning the highest officials and governor to an immediate conference at noon, the haste also unprecedented. Between the two sides the interpreters sat on cushions. The Japanese knelt, and the other, a Swiss, Johann Favrod, sat cross-legged, the common language Dutch. The meeting had already been in progress for two hours, English translated into Dutch into Japanese, into Dutch into English and back again. All Sir William's questions were misunderstood, or parried or needed repeating several times, delays were requested in a dozen different ways to consult higher authorities to institute examinations and investigations, and, oh, yes, in Japan examinations are quite different from investigations. His Excellency, the Governor of Kanagawa, explains in detail that, and, oh, His Excellency, the Governor of Kanagawa, wishes to explain in detail that he has no jurisdiction over Satsuma which is a separate kingdom, and, oh, but His Excellency, the Governor of Kanagawa, understands the accused drew pistols threateningly and are accused and guilty of not obeying Japanese ancient customs, and, how many foreigners did you say were in the foreign party who should have knelt? And, but our customs. Tedious, time-consuming, and complex lectures in Japanese by the governor, put laboriously into far from fluent Dutch and retranslated into English. Make it blunt, Johan, exactly as I said it. I have, every time, Sir William, but I'm sure this cretin isn't interpreting accurately, either what you say or what the Jappers say. We know that, for Christ's sake, has it ever been different? Please get on with it. 
Johan put the words into an exact translation. The Japanese interpreter flushed, asked for an explanation of the word, immediate, then carefully delivered a polite, appropriate, approximate translation he considered would be acceptable. Even then the governor sucked in his breath at the rudeness. The silence increased. His fingers tapped a constant, irritated tattoo on his sword hilt, then he spoke shortly, three or four words. The translation was long. Johan said cheerfully, without all the murd, the governor says he'll pass on your request at the appropriate time to the appropriate authorities. Sir William reddened perceptibly, the admirals and general more so. Request? A. Tell the bugger exactly. It's not a request, it's a demand. And tell him further, we demand an immediate audience with the shogun in Yedo in three days. Three days, by God. And I'm bloody arriving by battleship. Bravo, Count Sergeyev muttered. Johan was also weary of the game and gave the words a fine-tuned bluntness. The Japanese interpreter gasped and without waiting began a flood of acrimonious Dutch that Johan answered sweetly with two words that precipitated an aghast, sudden silence. Nan ya, what is it? What's been said? The governor asked angrily, not mistaking the hostility or hiding his own. At once, apologetically, the flustered interpreter gave him a toned-down version, but even so the governor exploded into a paroxysm of threats and pleading and refusal and more threats that the interpreter translated into words he considered the foreigners wanted to hear, then, still rattled, listened again and translated again. What's he saying, Johan? Sir William had to raise his voice above the noise, the interpreter was answering the governor and Bakufu officials, who were chattering amongst themselves and to him. What the devil are they saying? Johan was happy now. He knew the meeting would terminate in a few moments and he could return to the long bar for his lunch and schnapps. I don't know. Except the governor repeats the best he can do is to pass on your request etc at the appropriate etc, but there's no way the shogun will grant you the honor etc because it's against their customs etc. Sir William slammed the flat of his hand onto the table. In the shocked silence, he pointed at the governor then at himself. Watashi, me. Then he pointed out of the window towards Yedo. Watashi go Yedo. Then he raised three fingers. Three days, in a bloody battleship. He got up and stormed out of the room. The others followed. He went across the hall to his study, to the bank of cut glass decanters and poured some whiskey. Anyone care to join me? He said breezily as the others surrounded him. Automatically he poured scotch for the admirals, general and Prussian, claret for Seretard, and the significant vodka for Count Zergev. I thought that went according to plan. Sorry it was drawn out. I thought you were going to burst a blood vessel, Zergev said, draining his glass and pouring another. Not on your Nelly. Had to close the meeting with a certain amount of drama. So it's Yedo in three days. Yes, my dear Count. Admiral, have the flagship ready for a dawn departure, Spend the next few days getting everything shipshape, ostentatiously clear the decks for action, all cannon primed, drills for the whole fleet, and order them to be ready to join us in battle order if need be. General, 500 redcoats should be enough for an honor guard. Monsieur, would the French flagship care to join us? Seretard said, of course. I will accompany you, of course, but suggest the French legation as headquarters, and full dress uniform. No to the uniforms, this is a punitive mission, not to present credentials, that comes later. And no to the meeting place. It was our national who was murdered and, how shall I put it? Our fleet is the deciding factor. Von Heimrich chuckled. It certainly is decisive in these waters, at the present time. He glanced at Seretard. A pity I don't have a dozen regiments of Prussian cavalry, then we could partition the Japans without a hiccup and have done with all their devious stupidity and time-wasting bad manners. Only a dozen, Seretard asked witheringly. That would be sufficient, Herr Seretard, for all Japan. Our troops are the best in the world, of course after Her Britannic Majesties, he added smoothly. Fortunately Prussia could spare twenty, 
even 30 regiments for just this small sector and still have more than enough to deal with any problem we might encounter anywhere, particularly in Europe. Yes, well, Sir William broke in as Seratard reddened. He finished his drink. I'm off to Kanagawa to make some arrangements. Admiral, General, perhaps a short conference when I return. I'll come aboard the flagship. Oh, Monsieur Seratard, what about Mademoiselle Angelique? Would you like me to escort her back? She came out of her room in the late afternoon sunlight and walked along the corridor and down the main staircase towards the entrance hallway. Now she wore the long, bustled dress of yesterday, elegant again, more ethereal than ever, hair groomed and swept up, eyes enhanced. Perfume and the swish of petticoats. Sentries at the main door saluted her and mumbled an embarrassed greeting, awed by her beauty. She acknowledged them with a distant smile and went towards the surgery. A Chinese houseboy gaped at her and scuttled past. Just before she reached the door, it opened. Babcock came out and stopped. Oh, hello, Miss Angelique. My word, but you look beautiful, he said, almost stuttering. Thank you, doctor. Her smile was kind, voice gentle. I wanted to ask, can we talk a moment? Of course, come in. Make yourself at home. Babcock shut the surgery door, settled her in the best chair and sat behind his desk, swept up by her radiance and the way her coiffure showed off her long neck to perfection. His eyes were red-rimmed and he was very tired. But then that's a way of life, he thought, glorying in the sight of her. That drink you gave me, last night, it was a drug of some kind. Yes, yes, it was. I made it fairly strong as you were, you were rather upset. It's all so vague and mixed up, the Takedo, then coming here and, and seeing Malcolm. The sleeping drink was very strong. Yes, but not dangerous, anything like that. Sleep's the best cure, it would have been the best kind, deep sleep, and by Jove, you slept well, it's almost four. How do you feel? Still a little tired, thank you. Again the shadowed smile and it tore at him. How is Monsieur Struin? No change. I was just going to see him again, you can come along, if you like. He's doing well, considering. Oh, by the way, they caught that fellow. Fellow, the one we told you about last night, the intruder. I don't remember anything about the night. He told her what had happened at her door and in the garden, how one robber was shot and the other spotted this morning but had escaped, and it took all of her will to keep her face clear and to stop from screaming aloud what she was thinking. You son of Satan with your sleeping drafts and incompetence. Two robbers. The other one must have been in my room when you were there then and you failed to find him and save me. You and that other fool, Marlow, equally guilty. Blessed mother, give me strength, help me to be revenged on both of them. And him, whoever he is. Mother of God, let me be revenged. But why steal my cross and leave the other jewelry and why the characters and what do they mean? And why in blood, his blood? She saw him staring at her. We, oui, I said, would you like to see Mr. Struan now? Oh, yes, yes, please. She got up too, once more in control. Oh, I'm afraid I spilt the jug of water on the sheets. Would you ask the maid to deal with him, please? He laughed. We don't have maids here. Against Japa regulations. We've Chinese houseboys. Don't worry, the moment you left the room they'll be tidying. He stopped, seeing her go pale. What's the matter? For an instant her restraint had left her and she was back in her room again, scrubbing and cleaning and petrified the marks would not come out. But they had and she remembered she had checked and rechecked so the secret was safe, nothing was left to show, neither moisture nor blood, her secret safe forever so long as she was strong and kept to the plan, must, and must be clever, must. Babcock was shocked by the sudden pallor, her fingers twisting the material of her skirt. Instantly he was beside her and held her shoulders gently. Not to worry, you're quite safe, you really are. Yes, sorry, she said, frightened, her head against his chest, finding the tears were flowing. It was just, I, I was, I was remembering poor Canterbury. She watched herself, out of herself, allow him to comfort her, 
utterly sure that her plan was the only one, the wise one. Nothing happened. Nothing, nothing, nothing. You will believe it until your next period. And then, if it arrives, you will believe forever. And if it does not arrive, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know.